I'm Michael Herrera and the CEO of MHA Consulting. Today, I welcome you to the BCM Leadership Webinar, taking your business recovery plan beyond the template. Every day in our field of, of business continuity, we're writing business recovery plans. We're conducting BIAs and taking all that information and writing recovery plans. You know, many times we cre create these voluminous documents that we just hope our business units or other areas of our organization look at, read, and can execute. But again, in today's culture, as times are changing, we really need to take a look at how do we effectively create plans that can be effectively and efficiently, and most importantly, be used in an actual event. Do you suffer at times from people looking at plans, not knowing where, what, where to find the information? You hope they even bring their plan with them. They even know where it's at. So we have to really change with the times. How do we best create plans? How do we best train our people in order to be use the, use the information when they need it? but also trust them in order to execute, be a team of teams and move forward. So there's a number of concepts and subject matter we're gonna talk about today, but welcome again to our leadership webinar today on taking your business recovery plan beyond the template. Very quickly, uh, MHA Consulting has now been in business for 23 years. This is our 23rd year of operation. Uh, before I uh, founded MHA, I was a regional vice president with Bank of America where I had responsibility for business continuity across the entire Southwest region. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, we provide a very comprehensive uh, suite of services, end to end, whether you need to start from the beginning, assessing your program all the way through continuous improvement. You'll see in a second, we have a very diverse global client base. You know, the key thing here is as well as at MHA, we really seek to, to partner with clients to really have a commitment to BCM uh, versus a check the box mentality. Uh, it, and that is very important to us as, a, as an overall firm. From a unique or competitive advantage, you can see we worked across many different clients, clients across the global uh, landscape in all fields, whether it's services and technology, education, healthcare, government, utility. This is where also this webinar fits in. Every industry has a different approach or culture when it comes to business continuity. When you work in the financial uh, institution side, business continuity is, is built in their fabric. It's built into every day's decisions. Uh, as well as every day plus future decisions. Other uh, in industries aren't as, as focused on business continuity and their culture may ask for something different. When you're in FinTech, they may want something a lot lighter when it comes to plans or testing or their approach. So every industry has a different approach and that's why it's so unique, you, being able to understand what my industry is and how do I apply business recovery planning to it as well. Again, as I talked a little bit earlier from a, from a consulting side, we work end to end. I think one of our advantages too is we're accustomed either either doing all that we have to, providing uh, significant augmentation and or just finished fitting into one of these, these swim lanes and providing whether that's BIAs or plans or exercises. Last thing I'll mention on MHA and B, as we also have our own tool set that we use not only in our existing consulting engagement, but we have our own sub subscriber base in order to assess compliance, conduct BIAs, write your plans, store them, as well as to assess risk in your plans. So we're a very comprehensive consulting firm that not only provides a consulting expertise for business continuity and IT disaster recovery, but we also have the tool set that supports us, not only from a client perspective, but subscriber base for business continuity. So let's talk about the business continuity approach. It's changed dramatically. I've been now in business continuity 30, 30 years. From where we started to where I see plans going, where I see just the culture, uh, the attention span of our, our areas of operation, so many things have changed in those 30 years. What's expected, what can work, what doesn't work. One size does not fit all from a business continuity plan approach. Uh, you have to really marry it to who you are as an organization with legal, regulatory, customer requirements. Uh, today, I was on a prospective customer call where it was very clear that the plans they needed, needed to do one thing and one thing only, and that was fit audit requirements. Really wasn't about, is it, are our teams gonna be able to use it? Are they, is it going to be executable, meet the audit requirement, which is sad. But again, I will say in many organizations, that's where it is today versus making something that can really be used should you need it. First thing and foremost that I always talk to when I talk to BC offices, which is so important, do you really need to write a plan for everybody in your organization? And this is really impacts those that are medium, uh, you know, uh, that are a large, medium sized company and those that are just large companies where you may have hundreds of business units or 50 to 100 business units. Do I, does everybody need a continuity plan? 
One of the approaches we begin to use quite successfully with the number of clients is the relative criticality approach. So what we've done is said, who really needs a plan within our organization? And additionally, what level of support will we provide based on that level of criticality? And really simply to provide this to you, it's, hey, can you just put it into three different buckets initially? Who, what, which ones are critical? Which ones are important and, and other? And what is the level of support we're gonna provide? Those areas within the organization that out of the BIA that come out as highly critical, guess what? BC office is gonna provide full support they're going to be required to create a, a full comprehensive plan. We're going to spend the majority of time working with those business units. We're going to provide them with the most resources, make sure their plan's updated, make sure it's maintained, make sure it's exercised appropriately. So we're going to spend the majority of our time in that organization. Those that are important will reduce the level of time, but still help them and make sure the plan is current, up to date, meets standards, and but not necessarily provide as comprehensive testing. And then those that we deem as other We'll provide limited support and let them do more of their work. Because here's why we, we, we highly recommend this. What do we typically see? Most BCM offices aren't typically overstaffed or they're typically understaffed, and it may be one or two. And even those organizations we work with that have, may have six, eight, 10, they're still struggling to meet all of these business units and how do they support them from a business continuity plan perspective. This has worked well, really well for a couple of our clients where, again, they're able to better utilize their staff and most importantly for their company, focus on that those that are most critical. Now, out of the UK recently came a new standard called the Operational Resilience Approach, which is very similar to what I just mentioned in where they're looking for organizations and they're required to do this, those that are deemed critical to their infrastructure, financials, et cetera, those types of organizations. They're required to identify what are the most, most impactful services they perform and in some organizations, that may be three to five, seven, eight, but it's a, it's a finite small number. And out of that, what are all the business units and processes attached to those most impactful services? And they're required within a 24-month 24 24 time frame to document plans, mitigate gaps, and implement strategies that will ensure that those most impactful services will be up and running and minimize impact to those customers and those stakeholders. And that's really, again, a, a really good approach where, again, it's reducing the scope of what needs to be done at an organization and providing BC with the, with the direction as to where they want to go. A lot of times we'll see BC offices will just be out there trying to boil the ocean. Everybody needs a BIA. Everybody needs a plan. And there is real no real direction of what we're trying to protect and where do we want to put our time, resources, and effort into to make sure we bring the most value of investment back to our organization. Now, some of you, from a, from a continuity plan perspective, some of you may be a, of a size where you may only need one enterprise business continuity plan. Others, because of size and complexity, you're going the traditional route of very individual continuity plans for finance, accounting, uh, call center, all of those plans. So you may have either an enterprise plan, typically enterprise plans work for organizations that are of a smaller size, 100 or, 100 or less employees. We have clients that do that, or we may have manufacturing plans where an enterprise plan works for them versus breaking them all out into multiple plans. That's another piece of learning. How do I take my plan beyond where it is today? What is What approach do I really need? Will an enterprise plan work or individual plan work? Make sure you look at what works best for you and your organization. So that way then it'll also help you in the level of effort, time, and, and resources you need to put into this. But the majority use individual continuity plans today. Now. When I was a DRJ and I gave this, this presentation this last fall, I, I asked everyone, everybody of course, had a, I had about 100 people in the class. First question I asked, how many of you have business continuity policy? Of course, pretty much everybody raised their hand. Then I asked the second question, under that policy, how many of you have, have a documented the appropriate standards that you need? How many of you even have a plan development standard that tells the end users out there that are gonna be part of business continuity how they're required to build their plan, how they're required to maintain it, how they're required to test it. Let's say, I will just say the level, the number of hands that went up went down dramatically. Because again, uh, we find a lot of offices in doing this process, they just go out and start creating plans. They take no time to step back and say, here's what our policy says. And based on that, here's the approach we're gonna take for building plans. And that way you can go back to say, those that are critical, here's the standards on how we'll create your plans. Those that are important, Here's how we'll create your plans and everyone else, this is what's left for you to do. So really important you set that standard up in advance 
so that again, you know where to put your time and effort. And most importantly, the end users know what's expected of them. They know when what, what information, the minimum they need in the plan, when they need to maintain it, how often they need to maintain it, how often they need to test, and most importantly, what level of testing is required. That will make your job so much easier if all this is set up in advance. And what I always tell people, the beauty of, of a standard is this. If you're starting anew and your program is at infancy, you can less you, you can make the standard not as rigid, but as you enhance your sophistication and maturity, you enhance those standards to make it harder over time as your program gains that maturity and capability. Now, very important. I think a lot of people forget this, that a plan is more than a plan. It's really made up, a plan is really is made up of, of a group of controls. And we look at a plan in a number of different controls. A plan has a, a business impact analysis associated with it. It has recovery strategies associated with it. It has a recovery team, uh, the plan itself and its content, recovery exercises to make sure that, that the strategies and capabilities and, and what's identified as, as critical processes are addressed. Uh, we also have training and awareness that's associated with a plan. No need to have a plan if our people aren't trained and, and consistently made aware as to what their roles and responsibilities are in a disruption. And then lastly, supplier risk. So at MHA, we really look at all of these controls and each of these controls has a relative importance to the capability of that plan, some more than others. I will tell you typically what we find in most organizations, there's two key controls that we typically find have the most significant gaps and in the end have the most impact. One is recovery strategies. We'll see these plans that are well, even the plans that are well written, they'll talk to a recovery strategy, whether that's work from home or uh, alternate site or a hybrid approach or whatever the strategy may be. Typically we find that strategy either hasn't been fully implemented or fully vetted. So you really never know if it's gonna work or not and it'll be implemented at time of event versus knowing in advance it works. The second is recovery exercises. That is the most sig significant other gap we see. Most people are still continuing to test or exercise at a tabletop level, at a tabletop level. That has value, but it ha doesn't have long-term value for those that are critical that you truly have to validate can do what they say they're gonna do. And secondly, most times people are doing tabletop in a siloed approach. They're not doing integrated approach, which we'll talk about in a, a, a little bit uh, from here. But remember, in making your plan and your templates work and the overall process work, you have to understand a plan is more than a plan and it really consists of a number of controls and all these controls need to work together to make sure your plan is executable. Now, once you understand that your plan is, is more than a plan and you understand these controls, you can begin to do what we do, is, which is a plan health check. And based on the level of criticality we decide and what level of, of effort we decide to, to place on each of these levels, critical, important, or other, you can then also then begin to check how, how healthy are each of our plans. So we like to look at all those controls we mentioned. We like to weight those controls based on what we believe is importance. We, and then again, we already know what our, we then are able to rank the state of health of each of those controls, BIA, recovery exercise, recovery team. And we give it a level of, of capability one being it doesn't exist to five, it's, it's consistent with best practice. You're very quickly on each plan able to translate that, that, that ranking of what's the capability times the weighting of that control and, and translate that to an overall percentage. And what we like to do is then say, if you're a critical plan, your minimum plan health needs to be 90%. If you're important, it needs to be 80 or 75%. Everyone else will accept this minimum level. But you're now not only able to say, here's who we're, how we're gonna uh, approach business continuity plans. We're now able then to say, here's the controls and then be able to say, which ones are healthy, which ones are not. You're then able to go back to management. Very importantly, say, here's where we need to mitigate risk and gaps based on where you see some global trends, whether it's exercises, training, uh, whether you also see anything with teams that they're not properly identified. This plan health check is a simple, easy way to really to begin versus just writing a plan to truly understanding what are its controls, what's the state, and where, what things need to be fixed. Now, in, a, in, in, in full integration with plans, we all know we can write the best plans, but how many of you today go do exercises or you've been through real events, <laughs> people don't know their plan, they don't bring it, they don't know who to talk to, uh, it's, it's, it's not even organized chaos, it's chaos. And one of the biggest reasons is what we see a lot of times in today's organizations is 
management doesn't give us enough time for training, awareness. Not We're lucky if we get time once a year, let alone throughout the year to make sure our people are prepared and they know how to work as a team. They know what, what needs to be, what, what is required. I recommend a book that you read. It's called, it's from General McChrystal. It's called Team of Teams. Uh, this book has been out for a while. And a lot of times I'll read these types of books where it's like, well, will that really have any rev relevance to our industry? This book has tremendous relevance to business continuity. And, and General McChrystal writes about how the military and its approach, its hierarchy, its organizational response was rooted back in how we still create our plans from an organizational level, how we always have this hierarchy where we can't make decisions without going up to the, to the level above us, et cetera, and how they in the military aspect had to change their approach, how they had to change their teams, okay? How they had to train their teams, how they had to make sure their teams, yes, could they rely on their documents, but typically once they got into a, some sort of crisis, it's a little late for them to, to, to always have to reference their plans. So how do they build this team of teams? So that's what we're gonna talk a little bit about, but very, very critical. Now, and here's why, how many, again, with recovery teams, there's many times you, you hold exercises or you have real events and it's organized, it's not even organized chaos because people don't know how to work together. You hope they not only know their department and how to recover, but how do they integrate with internal, external dependencies? Uh, are they afraid to make decisions? We see that a lot. We see teams become suddenly quiet. They know what they need to do, but they don't know how to work as a team and a team of teams with all those others they need to. Because again, as, we, as we've seen, crises are very unpredictable. That, that document you write, it's great, but is it many cases? You may have to throw that to the side because it may not even relate to the event you're trying to deal with today. Secondly, we have to train our teams to to be prepared to make decisions without any fear of repercussion. They have to be able to make command decisions with always not always having to ask for approval from those above them. Those are the best team of teams where people are entrusted with that, can make the decisions they need. And I'm sure you'd all agree. Typically what you find when you go out to a business unit, those people know their line of business. They know what impacts them. They know what to do. They just need to be given that ability to go off and do what they need to do. Now, this comes within reason, of course, but very importantly, Trust them and they know what they need to do. Second item, and this was something that was interesting that was even written by General McChrystal. And again, this is a military base, or, right? Is even in that organization, they had to train their folks to truly understand what the purpose was of the overall organization. What are we overall trying to achieve? How their function integrated with it and then any impacts to that, how would it impact those on a downstream and upstream perspective? We see this a lot where organizations will, will simulate an event impacting a department and there is no idea how this impacts the overall organization and then how will it may impact in upstream or downstream pieces of the organization they need to integrate with. How many times we'll see this with IT, where IT will have an event and we'll, it's, they will only talk in technology. They will talk in, in servers that are impacted versus talking in services or processes that are impacted. So you can see that's just a great example how that happens because they don't really understand how what they do, how it truly relates back up to services or processes and the customer in the end. So here's what I'll say in the end. We've seen as teams become integrated, as they become to truly understand their purpose, they're given that ability to execute based on their knowledge and their capabilities. It builds trust. Teams begin to understand, I can do this. You know what? We're smart. We're, we can adapt. And we can on the fly make decisions that we need to in order to keep our business running. So that's really important. So I highly recommend that book, Team of Teams, and how do you use this in order for your business continuity program? I guarantee you, you will glean a lot of information that will help you. Okay. Now, so this is kind of in summary. We already talked about teams need to know their purpose, unafraid to make decisions, be able to operate on their own, uh, fully integrate. And what I mean by fully integrate, there was an exercise I did, uh, I would say about six months ago, and it, the departments were just, could not believe all the areas they forgot they integrate with or who they need information from, whether it was upstream or downstream or, or external to them and how they really needed to meet these people and get to know them. I will tell you one of the most valuable things I've in my entire career that, I, that I've seen is it's amazing when you get people just face to face, they may not know everything what the other department does, but it's great when they know each other just face to face and a name. So if something does happen, a phone call, a communication, they know who's calling them and why and how they can help. So that's why the integration is so, so critical. Just ability to integrate and communicate with each other. Uh, adapt. 
this is an interesting thing. It's, it's simple for some teams, some not so. They're afraid to adapt. They're afraid to go off script, off their plans. That's why when we talk about writing plans, which we'll talk about it, it's got to be lean to the point. And you know what? You don't need the kitchen sink in them. Remember, use the checklist manifesto approach. Write in there what a seasoned professional might forget. They need to be able to do that. Okay. Next thing is as you conduct exercises with your plans, how many times we see people just conducting silo based tabletop exercises? That's it. They don't go any further than that. They test finance, accounting, they'll test, uh, you know, operations, manufacturing, but it's all siloed. There's no integration. There's no integration across all these different groups. That's why, in, as we stated in our first couple of slides, when you begin to really identify what are the most impactful services, who fits under them, and you begin to test, you move from silo to integrated across those services you provide as an organization, it will bring significant value, significant value and return on investment to you because people begin to understand who do I really depend on? How do we all work together as a team? How do, can we make our independent but also joint decisions so critical? So we recommend integrated scenarios by critical service. Go out and get all your teams that have worked across the critical service hold integrated exercises where they initially start with tabletops and then over time you move to more functional especially from a critical perspective because again you learn now how do i deal with my all my internal dependencies all my external dependencies and then very important how do i deal with management to make those high level strategic decisions so you can see we're really trying to move away from the classic uh organizational based hierarchy where teams become adaptable flexible they know who they need to talk to they use a streamlined plan that only provides them what minimum information they need to know. And we trust them through testing and exercises over time. They know what they need to do. I think you would find that most 78, they already know 70, 80% in their brain of what needs to happen in a disruption. That plan is simply there as that final reference point of something they may have forgotten. Building tomorrow's plans. This is something I, I think at MHA, we really thought a lot about. Because, you know, as a consultant, it's, it's, you know, it's great if you're not ethical to easily just go out and write 50, 100 plans for clients. And you just create these plans and the back of the mind, a lot of times, you know, they're not going to go any further than that. You hope they get maintained. You hope they kept up to date and are tested. But in majority cases, not. And that's something that we we really thought about and thinking, how do we change how what we write? How do we make sure it's what is really usable? versus just following a standard template. That's why the culture of your organization is so critical. Your legal, regulatory, customer requirements all fit into what is it I, what does I need to do, but in the end, make sure something can be used. So first and foremost, in writing tomorrow's plans, this is something we see a lot of. Educate your management. As a consultant, I would tell you, we're on the front line of this. Not only will you hope they understand the terminology, uh, Matter of fact, that's why we just, in one of our next uh, eBooks, it's just simply business continuity terminology. Do they really know what a BIA is versus what a, a business continuity plan is? What is it, what is accepted testing? What is accepted maintenance? They understand how I'm gonna create this entire workflow. What's a workflow to get me from BIA to testing of my plan? Do they understand the time commitment? Uh, and we all know today's workforce, especially with the reduced workforces we're dealing with, Management, you educate them, say, this is how much time I need for the BIA, how much time I need to create the plan, but most probably for training and awareness and get more time for training and awareness because people are shrinking and shrinking that time. We all know I may have a great plan, but if I don't know how to use it and I'm not stress tested under a simulated environment, good luck. Uh, also let your management know what the plan does and doesn't do. There's some things it's not gonna save you from. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to go off script and come up with a new plan based on the incident. Uh, you know, you see that a lot with incidents. They just morph into things that aren't perfectly covered in your plan. You may need to use pieces and parts. So let your management know it's not the catch all. It's more about that training and exercises. I'll leave you with, a, uh, with this quote here. Remember, you don't rise to the level of the crisis. You sink to the level of your training. So, so true. Let your management know that the plan is not more than just that document you create. It has to do with all of those controls and they all got to be in sync. And they all got to be best practice depending on the criticality of that area. Um, and then the need for training and exercise. I'm amazed at the amount of time management gives us to do BIAs, the plan, the time they'll give us to write plans. But as soon as you tell them, hey, I need 
uh, I need an hour for training and awareness, and I need a couple hours for an exercise. Whoa, they stop you right there. And we all know that's the most important piece, getting this information into people's head so they can quickly respond without thinking. It's embedded in their brain and their database they got up upstairs. All right, and then lastly, always try to take their inputs and thoughts. That, you know, Again, they have a strategic view. They may be able to help you and say, here's how we want it implemented. This is what works better with this group or that group. So take their inputs and refine your process so it works with the culture and the vision of your organization. Okay, now, when people are, you know, it's so nice when you've got a Greenfield, uh, you know, new business continuity team or office, because all these things I'm talking about is so great when you're starting, you can think about them and say, man, how do we really create this business continuity process that's gonna work for us? But even if you already have an existing one, you know, still seek to build around your environment. You know, what is really the level of re uh, regulatory contractual and service level expectation? Are we in the financial industry where it is so tight, such a high level requirement of controls and mitigation of risk? Or are we in other environments where we, yes, we need plans. Yes, we need to protect ourselves, but it doesn't have to be that level. What is, what is, what are those requirements? What does your management support? You may need to have a high level of planning and controls around all your plans, but management says we're not going to do it. Been there, done that. And you just need to understand that. They'll just say, give me the minimum plan I need in order to meet our requirements, no more, no less. So after time, by considering those, you can begin to figure out what is my minimum need? What is my minimum need based on what I have to meet from an outside legal, regulatory, customer perspective? What is managed supporting? What does that look like, okay? What is realistic as well? What is realistic to get, to get done? Um, what will work with our company culture? A lot of times we'll see these voluminous plans that you know the culture of the company, Nobody's gonna read it. They, it's amazing, we see this. You'll collaborate with a business unit. You'll spend four or five hours working with them in multiple meetings to create their plan. You take them to training and awareness, even a scenario. They still don't know what's in their plan. They still gotta to go to the table of contents. So work with what's, what your culture will expect. Are you more, uh, do you have a younger workforce? Do you have an older workforce? Uh, look at what's in your company and how, what plans and what capabilities need to, to younger generation typically likes really light plans. Okay. Especially in the IT environments we work in. And then lastly, be realistic in your time frame for completion. Uh, you know, we have folks that'll say, well, I got to create 40 plans in this time frame. Be realistic in your time frame for completion, especially if, if in your setup, you understand which plans am I really going to create in a comprehensive manner? Which ones can I not have to have as much information because they're not as critical? but be realistic in that. Uh, you know, most programs today, uh, from a moderate to large, you know, you can have anywhere from 24 to 48 months to, to complete and com produce a, a fully functioning business continuity uh, program, depending on your size and your complexity and the resources you have. Some basic rules of plan development. This is key in taking your template to the next level. Uh, number one, don't write the plan just for the sake of writing it. Uh, even as consultants, we're asked to do that because they've got to get through an audit requirement. You're just going through the exercise of putting what's in the plan just so they can meet specific rules. But a lot of people just go through, say, writing plans, generic tasks, which have little to no value. OK, now, second rule of a plan development. When you write your plan, assume you're going to have subject matter experts in that field that's going to be executing it. Years ago, it used to be the old mantra. Oh, you need to write it for anyone. It's not going to happen. You know, I'm not going to be going to one of our healthcare clients and moving to a clinical area and they're going to expect me to take over pharmacy and execute that plan. It's not going to happen. So when you make that assumption that subject matter experts are going to be executing, you can already cut down how much do I need to write that plan for? Because I'm already going to get the right people. Let's just write what I might forget. Okay. Make your plan event neutral unless you have specific events that you're, you're, you're consistently dealing with. Hurricane earthquake, tornadoes, anything that you have on a frequent basis, you're like, I have this plan that deals with event neutral stuff, loss of building or region, loss of technology, loss of resources, loss of supplier. But we have clients that'll have a separate appendix for hurricane, uh, et cetera, things that they re regularly deal with. So important there. <clears throat> Make sure your plans account for internal and external integration. You'd be surprised. Even if, after you do a good BIA, people for, might forget internal or external integrations. Know what they are. Have the right people to contact in advance. 
uh, well advance of an event. Uh, and again, we already talked about, tell me what I might forget, not everything I need to do. Again, most people today, if I asked you what you need to do, 70, they already have 70, 80% in their head. It's that last 20% they might forget. Um, now, what we like to do with each of our recovery scenarios too, loss of building or region, loss of technology, et cetera, is we try to you know, limit what, what's the real tasks we need to put in there. We typically try to limit the recovery tasks to one to two pages. So it's really tight and it really gets to what they need to know. Okay. What we, what you'll end up finding at least through, and I will say this from a, been through a number of real events with clients, as well as when I was in my previous life is sometimes the most important information is the supporting information. Who do I get in contact with? Who do I know I can call? Uh, who is it I need to call? That half the time, the supporting information is actually the most important. That's why when we talk about integrated and getting everybody to know each other, it sure is great that I met somebody, they know my face, they know my voice, and it can make things so much easier for recovery. All right. Last thing I'll say this, those areas of your, of your organization that are highly critical or even moderately critical, you never let them write plans on their own. I am not a fan of throwing either the BIA templates or plan templates and saying, hey, go after it. You really need to make sure you get good, concise information, data and information that fits your policy and your standards and your rules of plan development. Make sure, spend the time up front with those. You'll get high values of investment going forward. Eliminate all the non-executable information. I always use the example, uh, again, going back to uh, man Checklist Manifesto, uh, where uh, the surgeon who got tired of all the things happening that were bad in his surgery room, and he said, I've got to come up with a checklist. He said, I'm tired of people coming in here. They, have, they even had a case where somebody wasn't given anesthesia before surgery. They marked the wrong part of the body to be looked at. Uh, vitals weren't looked at appropriately. All these things, it's hard to believe it happens, but it does. So he said, well, who makes the world's best emergency checklist? So he went to Boeing because they do make the best checklist, right? If you take a look at their lists, when they, when they, for example, if they have an engine go out, it's the top 10 steps. They make assumptions that, First of all, I've got a seasoned professional in that seat. He or she's going to look at that checklist and go, okay, here's the things that I, I already, I'm sure you've already checked, but here's the things, the other things you might forget you need to look at to get that engine restarted. So you kind of need to use that same approach in continuity plans. When we switched to this approach, it was amazing how much tighter our plans got, how we really made sure that we only needed what we needed, and also the business units loved it. You know, that it was easy, easy to use and executable. Get rid as much executable, uh, non-executable information. In some clients, this non-executable information, we put into what we call a corporate guidelines document. So, and then when they got their plan, it was simply, here's what the department is, it's critical processes, here's how you recover. So we streamlined it tremendously. This kind of gives you an idea. We try to streamline templates. Look at your templates today. Most people's templates can be running 50, 40, 50 pages long, you know, get it down to those. How, what is it I really need? Uh, you know, a summary of the, uh, of, the, of the plan. What's critical in my department overview and process? Es how do I escalate to? Very quickly in two pages each, how do I attack each recovery scenario? And then all your supporting information. So you can even tighten this up more if you could get rid of some more of this information. But just that document somebody can get to, quickly reference, but most importantly, use the fact that they've been trained They've been made aware of the plan. And again, accounting for the fact they're a seasoned professional, they know what to do. So you can really cut back versus seeing the 50, 100 page plans we've seen. Or plans that, I think what I, I think one of the, the hardest parts as a consultant is at times being given crisis management plans, ITDR plans, business unit recovery plans. And as somebody who's been doing it for 30 years, you, you read the plan, you leave there confused and you're really wondering, do I know what I'm doing as a business continuity professional? And it's simply due to the confusion and how plans are written and how people are expected to use these in order to, to respond and recover as a reference document. Lastly, if we're not giving train and, time to train and exercise, all of this stuff we talked about, reducing which areas we're gonna focus our time and effort on, reducing the, the making sure we're providing the most time and effort to those who are really critical to the company, streamlining our plans. But if we're not given the time to train and train and exercise, in this last exercise, we were working with a, a organization in Indianapolis. It was wonderful to see because throughout the year before we even arrived, they were doing many exercises. 
They had worked together at, on their team on simple exercises and could, uh, increasingly complex. So that by the time we came and we did a full four hour exercise integrated with police and fire, it was great to watch them because not only did they understand command and control, they understood who was in charge, what their roles and responsibility, and to watch them use their plans. It wasn't, I don't know where information is. It was, I know I know what section to go to for what I need. That's where the value of training and exercise. It was calm, it was stressful, but not chaotic. So you must be given time to train and exercise. And I'll be honest with you, I can meet all the other controls, but if I'm not given the right time to train and exercise, your plan's not complete. You need to integrate. You can't con conduct silo exercises anymore. That's why if you go back to that operational resilience approach, understand your critical services and you test all those business units under those critical services you perform as a company. You begin to get them to know each other, execute, integrate. Uh, you will find it, it runs really seamless, okay? And I think one of the great things when training and exercise, we always try to do, let people try to adapt. You let them try to figure things out. They're smart, they know what to do and let them to say, yeah, I have my plan, but man, more importantly, I know how to adapt if I got to go out off script and do something completely different. Uh, so that's really important. Uh, and I think that's really worked well because in the end, what you really wanna build, we've had those clients where they've gotten so good at it, their confidence level on responding and recovering is seamless. And you love to watch that where you just sit back, they know what to do and they know how to get things uh, appropriately recovered and responded to. All right, so in summary, very important. What sets the stage? So in the middle here, make sure you have, and again, as I said, it was interesting in that DRJ class. Everybody raised their hand, they had a policy. Very few, if any, had standards, but those standards really have to integrate with the policy and set the, set the stage for how we're, gonna, how we're going to put our time, effort, and resources into BCP development. What are the requirements? Where are we gonna provide all our effort, moderate to no effort? across the organization based on relative criticality, create that template that works for you, that's streamlined, that allows you to basically place, here's what a, a business unit might forget and use. Uh, and then you move into, what are, again, what are all the requirements, right? What is it, what, what really affects my standards for development and my template? What are the requirements from a legal, regulatory, customer perspective? Some of you may have lots of requirements, some not as much, so it's more written for your organization. Uh, also, you got to work with training and exercises. How do we, everybody understand, really know what their role is? Do, I've been in exercise where people don't even know they were on the recovery team or they were the recovery team leader. I mean, these are basics. Or do I, do I know what I need to do? Do I know how to handle command and control for my area of operation? That's why training and exercises are so critical where you can make mistakes before the real thing happens. People fight us on that, but that's the reality uh, of the world. Okay, how to apply the plan. And there may be times that the plan has to be thrown out. And then lastly, working all this way to the company level. What is the company expectations? What's the culture and how do we integrate BCP into the culture of our people? You're gonna have different groups, different areas. You know, we all have done this many times. There's those groups we love to work with because their business management, they're on top of this. They wanna be part of it. They wanna integrate it. They make their people do it. You got other business units that are Hey, maybe, yeah, thanks a lot. We'll get the plan done, but you know it's not gonna be used. So you gotta learn to deal with all that because in the end, you still need to produce something that's executable. It still relies on you at the end to make sure it's all working and working properly. And then lastly, tying this back up to management. What's their expectations? Very important, what's their education? Have you educated them and educated them and educated them? Uh, we see this at all levels. This is probably the hardest part. Um, getting our management to understand what business continuity is and isn't uh, and what they should expect and also preparing them. You got to be honest with them and say, if they ask you, can we recover? Can we not? Some management teams take that really well. I will tell you some have a really hard time with the fact when you tell them they can't recover. I like they say they think they can. I want to thank everybody today for their time. And, and I'd like to see, are there any questions we may have? Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Well, in, in the company that I work now, we, we have a framework for BCM that we're implementing. Um, now I am in the part to, to define some KPIs, which uh, I don't know if you can recommend me something, but the basic structure that we have in our framework is the scope, the 
business impact analysis and risk assessment is the second stage. The third one is uh, the solution, which is makes sense with the strategy that you explained mm -hmm. and the plans. Uh, the fourth is the awareness and exercise. Yes. Uh, and the last one is the improvements. Everything observation that we found in the exercise, we improve and we continue the cycle, the cycle again. Mm -hmm. But as I, I told you, like we are planning to do like some KPIs in this same structure. I don't know if you have any comments about this that can help me. Absolutely. Um, three, here's how we like to have three strategic KPIs, right? Um, very important. The first is, first KPI we use is how well aligned is the program with standards, right? Is it being built properly? So we're able to tell management the program is being built foundationally with standard and be able to give them a, some rating or score, right? We're either you know highly compliant or not, and why? So that's KPI number one because that means we all, and here's how we we know we've proven it over the years as we've assessed programs and use our tool to assess compliance. The programs that are foundationally sound and aligned with standards perform much better than than those that aren't, right? So that's KPI number one. KPI number two, which goes back to this plan health, like you were stating, and also the components you look at. Not only do we assess plan health. But after we get that plan health score, we're able, we go back to management and understand what's their level of risk tolerance. So we can tie back plan health to what, what's level of risk they're willing to accept. And from that, we can tell them, well, what, here's the residual risk that remains. If management's willing to accept a lot more risk, your plan controls don't have to be as tight, right? Those that have a very low tolerance for risk, especially those in the critical areas, your plan controls must be higher. So tell me how foundationally sound I, I am and, and aligned with, with the standards. Number two, not only tell me the plan health, but what's the risk that remains uh, based on management's risk tolerance. And the third metric is a combination of, of compliance, residual risk. We call that value of investment. High compliance with standards, low residual risk due to good, to, due to good plan health equates to high value of investment. Management would love that because you're able to tell them, I've built the program based on, on, on industry standards. It's sound. I've reduced your risk to the minimum level you expect. You, the mo time, money, and effort you've invested in business continuity, you've had a high value investment. Does that make sense, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. One thing that I want to note to everybody, I see a lot of programs we work with and they'll give us the productivity statistics. Hey, I did 37 BIAs and I wrote 12 plans. I'll be honest with you, that means nothing. That just means volume of work. Tell me how well the program's built. Tell me where how much risk is left. And then tell me, is the value of investment good or not? I will be honest with you as a practitioner, being on both sides when I was a B of A, now a consulting firm for 20 plus years, a lot of BCM office and planners don't want to expose themselves to that and what we need to show management. But that's the only way you can create appropriate roadmaps, get the right budget, and go back to management and say, we got some big gaps here. We can't recover. Be be awfully, be brutally honest with management where you can recover and not. Great question. Well, I wanna thank everybody for their time today. Uh, after this MHA, we thank you for your valuable time. We thank you for, again, talking with us today at our, our uh, leadership uh, webinar today. We will have our next webinar coming up here soon. So be looking out for that with well, MHA leadership a uh, webinar on business continuity will coming up here in the next quarter. And again, once we're all done, we'll make sure everybody has a link to the recording of this presentation today. So thank you everyone, be safe and talk to you again soon.